Hey class, I hope you guys are doing well. We are going to continue now on our lecture series uh, on the monarchs. Uh, last time we, we looked at the Tudor time period. We looked at uh, Henry VII, Henry Tudor, all the way through Elizabeth I, and we saw what took place there and with uh, who was um, uh, the king and queen and, and the intrigue that took place there, the storyline that took place as the monarchs of the House of Tudor went down went down through. Well, after Elizabeth I, um, she died. She Remember, she was not married. She was called the Virgin Queen. Uh, she didn't have any heir. And so what happens is we have the, um, the House of Stuart, uh, the Stuarts. They, they come into play here. And the reason they come into play is because back then at the time you had the, uh, the country of England, but you also had the country of Scotland. And Scotland had its own uh, kings and queens and all of that, if you remember uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, but you, you had um, a monarchy in Scotland. Well, what happens is the first monarch of the House of Stuart is James I, but in Scotland, he was the King of Scotland. In Scotland, his name was James VII. And so um, James VII of Scotland, he takes over the country of England, and so now he's in charge of Scotland and England. So now we're starting to see a Great Britain being formed, and you have James VII, also known as James I. Okay, so um, it can be kind of confusing, but you just try to stick with it as I, as I go through the PowerPoint. It's trying to keep it in mind of, of who is who. The first slide um, in the PowerPoint is going to be the names uh, uh, in order of the monarchy for the House of Stuarts. After that, we are then going to look just briefly at um, the monarch, a couple of monarchs in France and a couple of monarchs in Russia. Uh, the reason is, is that all during this whole time there's, that we're talking about England, because I, I, I just think it's just really interesting and uh, regarding England and how it's, England was basically the ruler of the world uh, all the way up through uh, towards the end of the 19th century. So uh, we, you, need, you need to pay attention to what's going on in England. But there's also monarchs in France, and there's also monarchs in Italy and Spain and, and Russia. So we're going to talk about uh, two of the monarchs in, um, in France and then two of the monarchs in Russia. And that's going to be it for the monarchs because then we're going to start picking up during the time of revolutions uh, in the coming lectures. Uh, we're going to pick up other um, monarchs during during that time uh, also. We'll, we'll know who's ruling the countries um, as the revolutions are taking place. So we are going to move now into the PowerPoint looking at first at the House of Stuarts. Okay class, we're going to now have the PowerPoint on Monarchs Part 2. As I said, we'll be talking about uh, the House of Stuarts. It was the next house after the House of Tudors. So uh, these are the monarchs, and some of them are not monarchs, but these are the monarchs slash ruler of, uh, of England during the time period after Queen Elizabeth. So as you see on the screen there, I know there's some, some arrows and all that. I'll explain it. The first monarch after Elizabeth I was James the Sixth or James the First, and the reason is because James the Sixth was the king of Scotland as James the Sixth, but he became the king of England. Which, um, when he did that, he was renamed James the First. So it's the same guy, but a different number after him. So we got to kind of keep this straight. So James the Sixth or James the First. Um, the monarchs of Scotland were separate from the monarchs of England until the Stuarts. Okay, so. And the Stuarts kind of brought these two together uh, because of the line after Elizabeth I had no children. James VI, or the I, became the king. He had a son, Charles I. Now, Charles I, we're going to get into some of the, this already in the PowerPoint, but uh, Charles I, uh, he was succeeded. He was actually executed, but he was succeeded by uh, Oliver Cromwell, who was not a king. He became Lord Protector, which is kind of like, I guess you can kind of think of it like the Prime Minister. He, did, he, was, not, he was not a monarch. He was not the king. The, the monarchy was actually abolished under, uh, after Charles I was executed. So uh, Oliver Cromwell became like the leader of England. And then um, you uh, have the monarchy reestablished with Charles II. 
After Charles II, you have James the Seventh or James the Second. Again, they're the same same guy, just a different number. Okay, so you got to kind of keep this straight in our heads. Following, oh, let me before we go any further with that, uh, Charles the Second and James the Seventh or the Second, they were brothers. Okay, so James the Seventh or Second was not the son of Charles the Second. Okay, they were brothers. After James the Seventh or Second. Mary the second becomes queen and she is um, married to a man named William the third of Orange sometimes he's just called William of Orange but it's William the third of Orange uh, they were married and they became co-monarchs and what happened was Mary the second who was in in the line, uh, they, she died, and William the Third of Orange became the the sole monarch. But what's what's um, interesting is William the Third of Orange was not from England. He was uh, a prince. Um, we'll, we'll get to all this. Uh, a prince in Europe. So William the Third of Orange is is king, and then when he dies, uh, Anne, who is Mary the Second's sister. Um, she t- she becomes queen, and then that ends uh, the House of Stuarts because following that comes the House of Hanover. So that's just a rundown of the of the monarchs. Okay, we're going to run through each one of these. James the sixth or the first. Again, same guy, different number. You see his life, 1566 to 1625, and his reign was 1603 to 1625. Again, the only reason I have those dates on there is so you can get a familiarity with uh, the time period that we're in and just kind of keeping our keeping track of like the time period and timeline uh, that we have. The, the dates are not going to be on the exam. I'm not going to say when was the reign of James the sixth or first. Okay, so he was James the Sixth, King of Scotland, and James the First, King of England, and he was the only son of Mary, uh, Queen of Scots. Okay, so that's not the same as Bloody Mary, the Mary the First of of the Tudor time period, but this is uh, um, James the Sixth or the First is the only son of Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, when he was um, ruler he was a very strong advocate of royal absolutism which means the king of england which actually becomes the king of great britain because it's bringing scotland and england and all that together uh, he called himself the king of great britain royal absolutism is uh, almost like um the absolute authority lies with the king not the parliament not with the people it's, it's the royal absolute authority. And under James the Sixth or First, I'll just call him James the First. Under James the First, we have this idea of the divine right of kings. Now, the divine right was this ideology that the kings of Great Britain have the authority given to them directly from God, and they serve as God's lieutenants upon the earth. Now, they're already the head of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. They're already the head of that. And now they have this idea, under James I, of the divine right of kings, where God has given them direct authority, right from God to the king. Uh, there's a picture of James the um, First. I don't know who painted this. Um, that's the great thing about Google. I went on there and found this picture of him. Uh, one thing is for sure, I will never wear an outfit like that. But you can see the time period. It's, it's changing. You can see the, uh, the differences with the, uh, the clothing that's represented in the in the paintings and as we continue on with the Stuarts uh, with the coming up pictures uh, paintings that you'll see um, their clothing becomes very extravagant okay so under James the first we have a few just basically key things that take place Uh, first is called the gunpowder plot of 1605 
when Elizabeth I died, uh, many Roman Catholics who were still in England, again, the, the, the Roman Catholics, they could still worship and all of that there. Um, they just weren't part of the Church of England. Uh, many of them did leave. Many of them went to Europe. But there were still some Roman Catholics in England. Uh, the Roman Catholics, they had hoped that um, they would be able to worship the way that they want. You know, So the last of the House of Tudor has died, and um, who's going to be next? Well, James I uh, is the new king, and he says, no, you can't worship how you want. And so there's this man named uh, Guy Fawkes. His real name is Guido, Guido Fawkes. Uh, they call him Guy Fawkes. He plots to blow up um, the Parliament building when James I is present with the Parliament. And uh, the plan never came to fruition. The uh, plot was discovered. And really what it was was that there was 36 large barrels of gunpowder being stored in a house next to the Parliament building when they were found out. And... Um, and so they investigated, and they found the perpetrators, Fox and some other plotters, and they ended up being uh, hung, uh, drawn, and quartered. And what that means is um, after their trial, which they were obviously found guilty, uh, they were hung, and then drawn and quartered means they um, were basically cut up into pieces. And they're, in this case, their uh, pieces were thrown out for the birds um, to eat their flesh. So that's the gunpowder plot of 1605. This is a very uh, um, well-known event in English history, and so like today, they have um, they have like a celebration of this. Uh, people dress up like Guy Fox and and they um, act it out of the gunpowder plot. So it's kind of a a remembrance today. Uh, but definitely a big deal, the, this uh, gunpowder plot. The, the British would definitely know about this if you started talking about it. Okay, so under James I, still under him, um, we have the, the King James Bible. The King James Bible was written under James I, obviously um, a very well-known edition of the Bible, translation of the Bible. You may have one on your desk or bookshelf or nightstand uh, KJV uh, version, uh, old, written in Old English in 1611. But what, what the King James Version Bible um, did, the way it came about, was in response to, it was a response to the Puritan Genevan Bible. Now remember, the Puritans were trying to purify the Church of England. Well, James I is the head of the Church of England. And the Puritans had their own Bible. It's called the Genevan Bible. And it's, it's a fine translation and all of that. But the key thing is that it had Puritan commentary and theological notes printed in the Bible. You might think of it as like a really early um, Bible commentary Bible or something like if you have a, a study Bible that has commentary on the bottom part of the page. It's similar to that. It had um, Puritan commentary and theological notes. Well, King James was unhappy with the Puritans because the Puritans rejected the divine right of kings. The Puritans did not believe that the king had the the direct um, the right was directly given from God to them. Uh, they rejected that. They they thought that the Church of England needed to be purified. So the King James uh, so King James was unhappy with the Puritans. But then also, uh, the, the Church of England bishops were unhappy of Puritan reforms. So now you have the Church of England, uh, they're called bishops, the pastors of the Church of England. Uh, they don't like how the Puritans are trying to reform the Church of England. And so they kind of get together and they um, develop their own Bible from the king to the masses. And so you see on the screen there, it was author he authorized a new translation from the original tongues in 1604. It was completed in 1611. It's called, today it's definitely called the 1611 authorized version of the KJV. Uh, this is the version that King James would uh, approve. Uh, the Geneva Bible was banned and ownership of a Genevan Bible became a felony. Uh, the KJV was uh, produced cheaply. It was pretty cheap. 
and sold to the masses. And many people believe that it is the best English translation. Uh, I, I will say it's a very good translation. Uh, it's directly from the Greek and uh, from the Hebrew, uh, Greek, and Aramaic. It's directly from that. Uh, almost, it's a word for word translation. So it can sound kind of wooden or choppy, if you will. And it's also written in Old English. If you read a 1611 KJV Bible, it's very difficult to read because of just the Old English. But some of the words used in the English are not all that accurate. So, for example, in 1611 authorized version of the KJV, the, um, the word unicorn uh, is used. It's trans. I'm not sure what the what the word is supposed to be, uh, but it's uh, translated as unicorn in a couple of places. So it's just um, it's a good it's a good translation, but you know it's it's a translation. Many people um, have opted for um, more modern versions uh, for language purposes, such as the New American Standard, the ESV. Um, even the New King James, I preach from the New King James when I preach. Uh, I think that's a good translation because it's mo more modern English, but yet sticks to the principles of uh, almost word-for-word -word translation. Okay, so that's it for Ch James the I. Uh, now we're going to Charles the I. You see a picture of him uh, there in his robes and his furry shoes. His life was 1600 to 1649. His reign was 1625 to 1649. And um, Charles I, he had, some, he had some problems. He had some difficulty. Uh, one of the big uh, things that takes place during his reign is that he had a real tumultuous time with Parliament, especially over taxes. There was just a lot of... Um, a lot of going back and forth and argument and deadlock and just they were not getting things done, especially with taxes. And so Charles I decides he's going to disband Parliament in 1629. And he declares himself personal absolute ruler. Okay? Personal absolute ruler. And that is from 1629 to 1640. Uh, basically, it was 11 years of tyranny. Uh, that's basically what it came down to. He... Um, he was basically it. There was no real functioning uh, government under his authority. But Parliament refused to obey, and they functioned on their own. They continued to function. Okay, so um, as they're, they're kind of going about their business, uh, apart from Charles I, so you almost have to, like two, two groups kind of running England. Charles I being an absolute ruler and Parliament being Parliament. In 1640, uh, there was a, a piece of legislation called the Root and Branch Petition where Parliament attempts to curb the Church of England's power. Okay, And the Puritans, they, they really like this because uh, Parliament is basically trying to take away power from the king who's the head of the Church of England. And again, as I said, Puritans really like this, but there's a big problem. This leads to the very well-known English Civil War, 1642 to 1651. Okay, so the English Civil War, um, it's actually a couple of different uh, time periods of warfare within those years, 1642 to 1651. There's actually like three times of Civil War, but it's all lumped together under the English Civil War. You have the Roundheads, that was the, their name, the Roundheads, which were the parliamentary army or the Puritan army. Most of the army was made up of Puritans. And they were um, against the Cavaliers, which, were, which was the royal army. So you have the two sides drawn up, the Roundheads versus the Cavaliers, or the Parliament slash Puritans versus the royals. And the Civil War was kind of... Uh, it was interesting because they didn't do a whole lot of fighting. They did do fighting. There's some, you know, there's battles, but they really did a lot of just marching around, trying to find each other and missing each other. But 
there are two battles that you want to know, uh, both of them being roundhead victories. So the Puritans are the ones that win these. The Battle of Marston and Moore, 1644, and then the Battle of Naseby, 1649. And the Battle of Naseby is the one where uh, Charles I is pretty much done in for. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, who is a roundhead, uh, he's, he's fighting in the English Civil War on the Parliament slash Puritan side. Uh, he's rising to um, military and political prominence during this war. He's becoming very well known. He, he fought in the Battle of Naseby, where Charles I is captured. And um, you see there on the bottom of the screen, Charles I is captured and he's beheaded on January 30th, 1649. So you have the leader of Great Britain, who is also declared absolute ruler, who is the head of the Church of England, they kill him. They cut his head off. And when this happens, the monarchy is abolished and England becomes known as the Commonwealth of England. So it's no, there's no longer even a monarchy now in England. Here's a picture of the beheading of King Charles I. Okay, so he's about to, about to head about to be cut off. Not too many sympathizers there. He was not very popular. And when uh, Charles I is out of the picture because his head's cut off, uh, Oliver Cromwell, who I had mentioned, he, um, he becomes what's called Lord Protector. And like I said earlier, it's kind of like, uh, like, like the prime minister, I guess, without, with, without a monarch. And he really is the one that um, runs, the, runs the show the leader of Great Britain. Uh, this is the Cromwellian era, and there's a lot of things that take place. So Cromwell, his life, 1599 to 1658, he rules from 1653 to 1658, so not very long. But in English history, this is called the Interregnum, and that's Latin, and uh, it means between reigns. Regnum in Latin means to reign. Uh, inter, you can just think of that between, so interregnum, between reigns. So this is between uh, Charles I and Charles II. You have to like insert Oliver Cromwell in here. Uh, he's not a king. Some people actually wanted him to become a king, but he said no. Uh, because of his prestige from the Civil War, uh, he's made leader of the parliament. He was a strong advocate for a strict Puritan lifestyle. And so during his, his time, uh, he, banned, he, he banned some things. Some laws were passed. He banned excessive lifestyle. Um, he banned the theater. He banned gambling. He banned Christmas and Easter, the, the non-religious part of the celebrations of Christmas and Easter. When it came to remembering the birth of Christ or the death of Christ and resurrection, uh, that that was fine, but the the kind of like the party, joyous, um, kind of like almost secular uh, idea of Christmas and Easter, um, they he banned that. Uh, under uh, Cromwell, men in society wore black. A lot of black was worn, and men would cut their hair um, to have short cropped hair under him. But after him uh, comes Charles II, and so you see Charles II there. Kind of hard to see. He's got. Uh, he, he definitely does not have short cropped hair. He got a full head of hair there with a wig. But Charles II, uh, life 1630 to 1685, and he reigned from 1660 to 1685, and he went into exile in France and then into the Netherlands after his dad, Charles I, had his head cut off. So when dad is killed, the son, Charles II, he takes off into exile. In 1660, there's the Declaration of Breda. Declaration of Breda. And this is a, declare, a declaration where Charles II says he will pardon every, everybody uh, from the Civil War and the uh, Interregnum if they will be loyal to him upon his return to England. And and they a lot of people agreed with this, and so he returns and the monarchy uh, is restored. 
So he comes back in, uh, in 1660. Uh, five years later, 1665, is the Great Plague of London. Uh, this was a, a a real trying pestilence for the the people of London. And so at some points of this, it lasted 18 months. At some points of this, points of this, there were 7,000 people dying a week uh, in London. But in the end, it's estimated that 100,000 people died in 18 months, which is just a huge amount, a massive amount of people that are dead. Um, in 18 months, so he has that, but then it's uh, it's not a good time for Charles II because right on the heels of the plague, a year later is the Great Fire of London in 1666, where um, a big swath of central London was completely destroyed in the Great Fire. This fire, they believe, they you know, tried to do an investigation, they believe that the fire started in a bakery uh, in the... Um, central part of London. Now remember, when you think of this time period, many people had uh, moved into uh, the cities and so it became very populated. And the cities, um, you know, especially London, you know, you have one, one part of it is, is bordered by the Thames River. So it's, it's on the north side of the Thames River. So London was um, very congested and what they did was they began to build up. And so during the Tudor time period, you have the Tudor style architecture where um, you have like the first floor of a building and their timber frame. And then the second floor would be um, built on top and it kind of went out for larger. The second floor footprint was larger than the first. And then they would build a third floor, which the third floor was even larger than the second. And so it kind of became almost like a little top-heavy uh, looking kind of buildings with a lot of timber uh, framing, uh, thatched roofs, that, that sort of, a lot of wood. And so it was very congested and the central part of London basically just went up like a tinderbox uh, with the Great Fire. Not many people lost their lives uh, in the fire. Many people, you know, they just escaped, they got out of the way of the fire, but they couldn't stop the fire and it just, um, just destroyed the central part of London. Charles II, he is known as the Merry Monarch. Now, you remember his predecessor was Oliver Cromwell, who was a strict Puritan who banned theater and banned gambling and wore black and all of that. Well, Charles II was complete opposite. Um, he, it was just rebellion of Puritan values, this Merry Monarch, rebellion of Puritan values. He loved parties. He loved women. Uh, his court was known as a hedonistic court, and hedonis hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure, uh, especially sexual pleasure, debauchery. Um, so his court was hedonistic, complete opposite of the Puritans. And again, Charles II, he is the head of the Church of England, and he's just living a completely immoral lifestyle. Uh, he never produced a legitimate heir, but he did have 12 illegitimate children. So he had many women and had a good number of children, but never had a legitimate heir. And so what happened was many feared that when Charles II dies, that his brother James, the seventh or the second, okay, so remember back to that one slide where it had all the names, who's the Duke of York, many feared that he would become the king. And the problem is he was Catholic. And so we're trying to, starting to think now of the earlier time period with uh, Edward the Sixth, who is Protestant. He dies, the boy king. He dies, and um, Mary the First becomes queen, and she's Catholic, and turns the country back to Catholic. And there's all that bloody Mary, uh, a lot of persecution and martyrdom under her. Well, many fear that Charles the Second's brother, James the Seventh or Second, who's the Duke of York that he would become the ruler, and he's Catholic, and it might go back to that, this persecution. In response to these public fears, Charles II has his niece, Mary II. Okay, now her dad is James the second, seventh or second. Okay, so I'm going to go back one slide. On the bottom there, James the seventh or second, right here, I'm circling with my cursor, his daughter is Mary the Second. Okay, Mary the Second. Next slide. In response to public fears, 
Charles II has his niece, Mary II, her dad is James VII or II, wed William III of Orange, who is Dutch. Okay, but he's a Protestant. So you have the king setting his niece up with a foreign ruler. He was basically um, a prince uh, in... Um, uh, he was a Dutch prince of Orange. That's what, that was the name of the area that he was in, William III of Orange. However, this did not happen in time. Charles II dies, and James VII, who is Catholic, he becomes king. Okay, so there's James VII or II. <laughs> Same guy, different number. Okay, you start seeing the, the clothing becoming more elaborate, robes and furs and all kinds of big hair. James the Seventh or Second, his life, 1633 to 1701. His reign was 1685 to 1688. So right there you can see his reign ended before he died. Usually the reign ends when they die. Now, he was the brother to Charles II, and as I said, he's Roman Catholic. And what happens uh, during his reign in 1688, see, he only reigned just a short time, about three years, there's another very well-known event in English history that if you went to England and you said the Glorious Revolution, they would know what you're talking about. This is like, it would be like the United States, someone saying 4th of July, or... Um, I, I don't know, uh, Thanksgiving Day or something, you would know uh, definitely what it is. Uh, Glorious Revolution of 1688. And this is a bloodless coup by Mary II and William III of Orange. Okay? So you have a Catholic king on the throne... His daughter, Mary II, and her husband, William III of Orange, take the throne back. Okay, And there's a long story into how this took place. We don't have time to go into it. But basically, they come in and say, we are going to do this, and Dad flees. And you, you just think back, what about, remember, Charles I? He had his head cut off. So Dad is like, I'm keeping my head. And so he takes off and he flees and he's, he's out of the picture. But what happens is William and Mary are made joint monarchs. Okay, so you can see the dates of their reign. Mary reigns from 1689 to 1694. And that's the same time with William of Orange. But then she dies in 1694. So William of Orange... He is then made the sole ruler. Again, he was Dutch. He is made the sole ruler of England from 1694 until 1702. So that's the, um, the reigns of William and Mary. And, and this is the same William and Mary. If you are, have ever heard of uh, William and Mary uh, University, it's a research uh, college. Um, they're the ones that... Uh, basically sponsored William and Mary, because William and Mary is a very, very old um, uh, college in the United States. It may be the oldest college in the United States. So the result of the coup, next slide, is a picture of the two. So you see William III of Orange on the left and Mary II on the right. So they're joint monarchs. Okay, so this is important for you to know. Again, this is the result of the Glorious Revolution. Let me just go back so you can see it on the notes. The Glorious Revolution of 1688, very important. This is the result of the Glorious Revolution. There's no more absolute monarchy. Out of the Glorious Revolution is the establishment of the constitutional monarchy, and that is how England is ruled today. It's a constitutional monarchy in England today. With Parliament's Bill of Rights. Okay, so there's a Bill of Rights created, and Parliament has rights, and the, what, what the limits are basically of the king under the Constitution. 
And so that's number two. I said, uh, for some reason, I have that repeated in number one. So no absolute monarchy. Number two, establishes constitutional monarchy to this day with Parliament's Bill of Rights. Number three, ensured Protestants' faith in England. Okay, what that means is the Church of England and the Puritans were um, going, you know, head to head. They were arguing. They were fighting over things. They, um, they basically fought a war. <laughs> Uh, the Civil War, where you have the Puritans on one side and people loyal to the Church of England, the royals are loyal to the Church of England on the other side, you have the Protestants' um, faith in England is ensured. So basically, uh, Church of England and Puritans, you can all worship in the, in the land. You have another result of the coup is the Battle of Boyne. And what happened was James the Seventh or second, uh, he flees because he doesn't want his head cut off, but then he's like, you know what? I shouldn't have fled, and I want to uh, get back my throne from my daughter and her husband. And so he allies himself with the French, and he takes uh, an army, a French army, um, to Ireland, and Ireland is an island off of England, and so he has this big army in Ireland, ready to go across the water and invade England to take back the throne. Well, William III, he hears about this, and he gets his massive army, and in the in the history, you can see it's just it's a very large army that William III brings, and he actually invades Ireland first with this massive English army, and he defeats James the seventh slash second, defeats him, and he flees again. So he's out of the picture again for a second time. But that's one of the results of the coup was that he did try to get the uh, throne back. But William III stops him. Okay, and so the last monarch that we're going to talk about uh, for the Stuarts is Anne. Uh, her title is Anne, Queen of England. Uh, there's a picture of her there. Okay, um, 1665 to 1714. Her reign was 1707 to 1714, and she's the last of the Stuarts. Uh, she died of a stroke in 1714, and then the throne passes to George I. Now, George I is a grandson of James I on his mother's side, um, and this, uh, this will actually start the House of Hanover. So... Again, during this uh, PowerPoint and these slides, these kings they had other children, and other you know they became like uh, you know princes over different uh, areas of England and dukes and all of that. And so James the first through his line it goes down, it trickles down, keeps think down some generations trickling down, and all of a sudden you get to uh, George the first who is a grandson of James I on the mother's side. He starts the House of Hanover. The reason I bring that up, we're going to be seeing this in a little bit later, but George I's grandson is George III. And George III is the king of England who loses the American Revolution. Okay, so um, the House of Stuart ends, and then the House of Hanover uh, begins. But that's going to be it for the House of Stuarts. Before we wrap up this PowerPoint, we do want to look at a couple of other things. Um, I have just focused in on uh, some monarch monarch houses in England, uh, but there's other monarchs that are um, in power in Europe, and we don't have time to go through all of this. It's just um, just so much information. But I do want to bring up a couple of them. Uh, the first one is Louis the Thirteenth, uh, King of France, 1601 to 1643. So again, kind of the same time period as we were talking about the House of Stuart. Uh, his reign was 1610 to 1643. Uh, he became king at eight years old, and there was a man, um, Cardinal Riccolu, who was a Roman Catholic advisor to Louis the Thirteenth, and he establishes. There's that familiar word again, absolute monarchy. He establishes absolute monarchy in France. And because the king is eight years old, uh, 
the Cardinal basically sets up a network of loyal officials, and this is going to be what uh, establishes um, the the reigns of the kings of France that are going to be coming up, some of the very powerful uh, kings. Uh, another thing that he did was, because he's a cardinal who's advising an eight-year-old king, uh, he ran the Protestants out of France. So the Protestants were pushed out of France, so France was completely a Roman Catholic um, country. Next king is Louis, that we're going to talk about is Louis XIV. His life, 1638 to 1715. He reigned 1643 to 1715. There's a picture of Louis XIV. Um, again, you will never see me wearing that outfit or that wig. But it's very, very lavish. Where it's almost like he's got blankets over him. Okay, so he was known as the Sun King. And the reason this is that he chose the sun as his personal symbol. And that's, um, that's pretty unique because of what the sun does. The sun uh, is light. The sun is heat. Uh, the sun brings day. Um, it's a, a central part of our life. We don't think about the sun all that often. Uh, we take it for granted. Uh, but the, the sun is always there, and he's the sun king. So under Louis XIV, he is basically the epitome of absolute monarchy. And what this is, is he's basically a dictator. That's basically what it comes down to. And he has this phrase... I atat sieste moi. And what that means is I am the state. And so when he says this, um, you can just see that um, he, he is the one in charge and what he says goes. And if you cross him, then you um, are most likely going to lose your head. Uh, he had a long reign. During his reign, it's known as the Golden Age of French Art and Literature. Uh, he has a, a court a palace, excuse me, a palace built at Versailles. And Versailles was a hunting lodge, and he had it um, built into a palace, and it's called the Palace of Versailles. It is the largest palace in Europe, 230 acres of gardens. And if you know how big an acre is, um, you know, a pretty good size, good size piece of land is an acre. Most, um, most plots in a development are a quarter acre. Uh, maybe out in the country you'll have a house that sits on an acre of land with a front yard, backyard, driveway, and a house. But this is 230 acres of gardens, and then there's 1,400 uh, fountains. So huge. I have a picture coming up. Uh, just a huge palace, very um, extravagant. He annexed key territories uh, for France. Um, he became the dominant power in Europe. Again, Germany, um, they're, they're kind of, um, they're not consolidated yet. Germany is still a bunch of little kingdoms with uh, all their own little princes and all of that. Um, and then you have Italy, which is separated by the Alps. Uh, but really the dominant power in Europe is France. Uh, there's a picture of the Palace of Versailles. And so you can just see how massive that building is. I mean, just just massive. And if you see pictures of the inside, there's a lot of gold, um, massive halls. And you can see there the uh, part of the garden. Okay, um, we'll get back to uh, France uh, under the French Revolution. But we're going to move on now to Russia. Uh, we're going to talk about two Russian leaders. First one is Peter the Great. There's a picture of him. Uh, he reigned 1682 to 1725. Uh, he's from the, the Romanov. You may have heard of that name, Romanov Dynasty uh, Tsar. That's um, uh, T S A R or C Z A R, the Tsar, uh, which is basically like a Russian Caesar. He was basically like the emperor of Russia, if you want to think of it that way. But that's what a Tsar is. Uh, he, he did some things. He reformed his army with better weapons to make Russia a power. Uh, he made um, created a strong navy. And, uh, he controlled the Orthodox Church. He divided his, the vast lands of Russia. He divided it into administrations so that he could handle it better. 
Uh, he built St. Petersburg. So St. P- Petersburg, Russia is named after him. He developed uh, commerce and trade systems throughout the land, and he modernized the Russian alphabet. So that's, uh, that's Peter the Great. And the last um, one we're going to talk about for Russia is Catherine the Great. And there's a picture of her. She looks like a, a stoic uh, elderly lady there. Uh, but don't let the picture fool you because uh, she was quite immoral. Catherine the Great, her reign was 1762 to 1796. Um, she was the longest female ruler in Russia, known for her affairs of the heart rather than her affairs of the state. So she wasn't all that great of a, um, a ruler of the land, but she definitely became known for her um, activities with other men. In her teenage years, she married a Russian prince, Peter III, who would become Emperor Peter III. But and she marries him. <laughs> but here's the thing. She was unhappy with her husband because he was inept. And after six months on the throne, Catherine overthrows her husband with the help of her lover. And she controlled the administrations with military. And um, actually, she continued uh, serfdom, uh, kind of like indentured uh, servant, but uh, serfdom. She, she continued that uh, practice in Russia for quite some time under her reign, which if you think of uh, Europe or England, uh, serfdom had already been, basically is gone. But it's still there in Russia at this time. Again, look at her reign. It ends in 1796. So the United States is already formed as a country after the Revolutionary War. Uh, she had numerous lovers. And had one affair after another. As a monarch, uh, she gifted her lovers with lands and powers when they broke up, and and that's one of the um, one of the things that she did was that when she got tired or, of a lover or didn't uh, didn't want that person anymore, or they broke up for whatever reason. Uh, for, for them to go away quietly was important for her so that she could move on, again, ruling Russia, but then she can go find another another guy. Um, she would give them extravagant gifts, and you can see on the end of the bottom of the screen, one man she gave over 1,000 serfs, which were like indentured servants, serfs uh, when the affair ended. So, I mean, you just think about it. These, these are humans. These are you know, people and they're looked at as property, like, okay, we're going to break up and so that you are quiet and you go away quietly, I'm going to give you a thousand people. So that was Catherine the Great. And that is it for Monarchs Part 2. All right, students, that's going to be it for today. Uh, just uh, keep keep up on the notes, keep up on the reading. Um, we're going to be getting into uh, pretty much during this time with the, the kings and queens, the monarchs, and in the route, we're going to be getting a lot of information. A lot of information will be coming down the pike. And so um, it's not going to be as simple as, let's say, if you took me last semester where we looked at a civilization and we looked at like the gods of Egypt and went through a few of the gods. Um, we are now really going to start rolling with, uh, with a lot of different things, a lot of different information. So you got to really hang in there and keep up uh, on the notes. Um, and maybe review the notes once a week or so after the week is done on a Friday maybe. And just um, uh, review through your notes uh, from the week to just keep it fresh in your mind about uh, about what's taking place. Uh, next time we are going to begin our uh, lecture series on uh, the revolutions, and we're going to hit the, obviously the main revolutions. But next time we're going to start off with the ideologies uh, uh, behind the revolutions. Mainly, it's gonna, we're going to be taking a look at the Enlightenment because most of the revolutions um, kind of burst forth out of the ideology of the Enlightenment. So uh, hang in there. Uh, you guys are going to be doing okay. Just stick up with the, uh, hang in there with the notes, and um, we'll see you next time. Take care.